Uh, hello. Uh, good day, everybody. Be welcome to the session Coastal Processes, part of the sixth Air Center High Level Industry Science Governance Dialogue. I am João Lorenzetti from National Institute of, uh, for Space Research, INPE, Brazil. I will be the moderator of this session. I have an undergraduate in physics and a master and PhD degrees in physical oceanography. The objective of this session is uh, to contribute to the development of our air center mission on clean and productive coastal zones, bays, and estuaries to sustain biodiversity and ecosystem services for a blue economy, including the comparative assessment of initiatives of, and action uh, of research in several locations. Uh, this session is co-organized with GEO, Group on Earth Observations, and BON, Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. Today we have five speakers, okay? Uh, I would say that uh, we have a, a very nice uh, spread of subjects covered by these five, five speakers. Uh, we will have Victoria Coles from University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, Horn Point, Point Laboratory. Victoria is a physical oceanographer and her talk, uh, in her talk, she will provide an overview of work, research development of coastal resilience planning and management in Chesapeake Bay, watershed estuary and coastal zone. In the sequence, we'll have uh, Marcelo Ronick, University Federal of Pará, Brazil. Marcelo also is a, uh, has a doctor, a PhD degree in physical oceanography and his talk will be related to research initiatives in the Amazon coastal zone. Followed by Fifion Atkins, uh, who is a, um, a, she has a PhD in oceanography and works uh, in the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Her talk uh, will deal with nitrogen and its impact on coastal zones and how can we begin to link land use to nitrogen loading to better understanding urban nitrogen cycles and how we can mitigate nitrogen cascades in the coastal environment. In the sequence, we have Joselino Costa of CoastNet, Portuguese Coastal Monitoring Network, uh, José Lino is Vice Director of MARI, Marine and Environmental Science Center, of Faculty of Science, University of Lisbon, Portugal. He has a PhD in biology, and his talk will be the analysis of different monitoring types, direct, mandatory, and surveillance, using estuaries and coastal areas in the Portuguese coast. And last but not least, Francisco Campuzano of Maritech, uh, Marine Environment and Technology Center of the Instituto Superior Técnico, University of Lisbon. Uh, in his talk, he will uh, deal with uh, downscaling of ocean processes and integrating them to coastal processes to sustain the blue economy by using numerical models. I should say that uh, after the presentations, we will have a Q&A session of 15 minutes. And uh, when we finish our session, we'll have a breakdown room with 30 more minutes for those who want to continue discussing with the panelists, bringing their points of view, bringing in other questions that could not be dealt with properly in the 15 minutes, okay? The link to the breakout room will be available in the live stream chat 15 minutes prior to the schedule of the end of the session. We invite everybody, if possible, to stay for this 30 more minutes breakdown room. So without further ado, I would uh, ask Dr. Victoria Coles to bring her presentations. Thank you, Victoria. Floor is with you.
microphone. Thank you for that introduction. Can you see my slides? So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about Chesapeake Bay um, and this image as of the iconic uh, skipjack vessels that dredge for oysters over the past um, oh, hundreds of years in Chesapeake Bay. And so what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of an overview of the background of the process for developing the modeling systems and the strategy for maintaining healthy water quality in Chesapeake Bay. And so what you're seeing here is an image of the watershed and the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that that watershed really spans seven different jurisdictions of state and a huge, massive area. And so in the 1970s, late 1970s, there was a five-year study on degradation of the bay and what was causing the degradation in water quality and reduced fishery yield. And what they identified was nutrient pollution as an issue. So in 1983, um, the Chesapeake Bay program was established um, by three of the jurisdictions and eventually all of them signed on. And, and that sort of culminated more recently in 2010, the establishment I, uh, um, the, what they call the total maximum daily load, which is essentially an environmental protection agency mandated uh, reduction in the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus loading that each of these jurisdictions could yield, uh, could, could produce in order to maintain water quality in Chesapeake Bay. And so in establishing those loads, the Chesapeake Bay program had to develop a modeling suite that could estimate how, um, how this, this land to estuary to open ocean connection would result in water quality changes. And so that, that modeling suite included a land use change model, an airshed model that produced atmospheric deposition, a watershed model over the whole region that integrated those land use changes and routed physically water as well as nutrients to the estuary. Then they enter into an estuarine model um, and that estuarine model both calculates the physical circulation and also the biogeochemistry, phytoplankton growth and oxygen dynamics in the estuary. And those are used to go back to management then and say, all right, how much nitrogen and phosphorus can each area emit in order to maintain water quality standards in the bay? And so that modeling output is fairly, it, the model works fairly well. In fact, I'm just sort of showing a few things just so you can see that hydrological model on the left, uh, the dots are observations, the line is the um, model and it seems to capture the decadal variability, interannual variability over a decade. And, and more importantly, perhaps on the right, what you see here is that it, it's um, then used to assess what was the nitrogen loading in the base scenario of 1985. And then if in green, if these are each for each uh, tributary to the estuary, if every possible action were taken on the land surface to reduce nitrogen load to the estuary, how much nitrogen would still be entering the Chesapeake Bay? And so we can use models in these ways to make these management implications and to restore the health of the bay. And so what you're seeing here is one possible use of those models. Not only can they be used to inform nitrogen reductions, but in this case, the Bay Program model was used to look at how sea level rise how temperature changes in response to climate change and how the intersection of those two on the far right contribute to influencing uh, dissolved oxygen in the bay. And this is the primary measure of water quality health that's used by the Environmental Protection Agency. And so the Bay Program model predicts that uh, increased sea level rise will essentially increase the circulation in the bay actually oxygenating it, causing a, an improvement in oxygen. And so this is the important part is that the Bay Program model is excellent, but it's not the only model in town. And so other modeling efforts, um, showing just one other model, um, chess ROMs, which is used in a forecast mode. You can see the forecast for tomorrow on the left in bottom oxygen. 
But that model actually predicts a reduction in oxygen in response to sea level rise and temperature change. And so what we have here are multiple model systems and they are not actually giving the same answer. And one of the things that's been particularly effective in managing Chesapeake Bay is that the Chesapeake Bay program has been very open to this and they have encouraged the development of different modeling systems and they have welcomed trying to understand when we have results that don't agree with each other. So submerged aquatic vegetation is one of the factors that tells us that this, uh, this, this uh, uh, strategy is working, okay? So if we look on the right, we can see over time from 1985 to 2015 that nitrogen and phosphorus in the estuary have been declining and that in response, the area of bay grasses has been increasing. That's this upper figure here over time. There's lots of variability on a year to year basis, but a general trend to increase. And this isn't just academic, it's actually economic as well, because this grass traps sediment, it uh, takes up nitrogen, it improves water clarity, it reduces erosion, and it's a habitat for larval fishes and for blue crabs, for example, and it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> so we know that the strategies that have been employed are actually working. That is to say, we're seeing these changes in nitrogen loading. And so what are kind of the key elements that are aiding this restoration effort? And now this is just me and my opinion, but the first one is data. And the second one is data. And the third one is also data. <laughs> that is to say that we're extremely fortunate that in, uh, in developing the Chesapeake Bay program efforts, a very strong monitoring effort was employed to go out to the Chesapeake Bay. They've been measuring the same stations once a month for decades, okay, since 1983. And so that's how we can make these figures that look at the trend in phosphorus and nitrogen loading in a very, very noisy system. You need to have a very long time series. We also have excellent remote sensing data that can help to, um, uh, this is an image from yesterday uh, showing phytoplankton chlorophyll concentration in Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware Bay. And then we have historical data going back to even the 1900s on weather station. And so we can look at the variability over time in the environmental forcing that might be driving changes in the Bay that are natural or you know, part of um, long-term climate cycles. And then there's also from 1954 to 2018, a lot of time series for juvenile striped bass and other juvenile larval fishes. And so this, all this, this, this large amount of data has really been key to maintaining that restoration effort. The other element is that the, trans, the Chesapeake Bay program has been very transparent in their modeling system and has become more so over time. So those models are available to researchers. They're not a closed system. And the Science and Technical Advisory Committee is reviewing those models on an ongoing basis and the Bay program is open to critical feedback. <laughs> Many of us struggle with critical feedback and that's really something that's been a benefit. Furthermore, there's an open source effort, the CCMP, in which researchers have made their models and the data required to, uh, to set them up available to the entire community, open source. And that has really encouraged the research and the management communities to compare models and to understand what's driving the differences between them. And the last thing I'm just about done is that we have, um, I think creativity and working with the management and the jurisdictions involved. And so one example of that is that the watershed, the watershed model was actually simplified and condensed and made more empirical in order to provide it to managers at the county level. So these are small rural community counties with maybe only 30,000 people. And the managers in those communities can go in and run this model on the web and calculate how to most cost effectively implement management practices that reduce nitrogen and phosphorus loading. And so sometimes the best model isn't necessarily the one that can bring the community on board to implement changes that lead to improved water quality. 
So those are the factors that I think are central to um, improving uh, water quality in the Bay. And I have some stories if we have time later about successes and not successes, things that haven't always worked very well. Um, so I, I'll yield the floor here. Thank you, Victoria. Excellent talk, very stimulating. And uh, we could see very clearly how different methodologies huh, are needed to study a complex environment. Uh, we should use all these techniques, but uh, this makes things, uh, things a little bit complicated too, okay? <laughs> but uh, it's needed, no question. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Marcelo Ronick of Federal, uh, Universidade Federal of Pará, Brazil. Please, Marcelo. Yes, perfect. <clears throat> you can start, Marcelo, anytime. We don't listen to you. Nós não estamos ouvindo, Marcelo. You tem que colocar em, em tela okay. cheia. Ok, escuta agora. Tela cheia, por favor. Ainda não. Escuta tudo. Aí, perfeito, perfeito. Estamos ok, ouvindo. desculpa. Eu irei falar em português. Eu sou o Marcelo Ronick, professor Marcelo Ronick, da Universidade Federal do Pará, e coordeno o um laboratório de pesquisa em monitoramento ambiental marinho, localizado na cidade de Belém, na região costeira amazônica. E eu vou falar um pouco sobre essa zona costeira amazônica e alguns trabalhos que vêm sendo desenvolvidos aqui na região. Essa região costeira amazônica, é, ela sobressai pela, por dois corpos hídricos de extrema importância para o Atlântico, o rio Amazônia e o rio Pará. É, esses rios, eles têm uma influência muito grande para o Atlântico e também no, todo num contexto social e econômico aqui da região amazônica. Adjacente a esse sistema, nós temos uma faixa de aproximadamente 650 quilômetros de manguezais. É a maior faixa contínua de manguezais do mundo. Então, uma coisa muito importante de se observar aqui na região costeira amazônica, que é uma área extremamente plana, né, com altimetria abaixo dos 10 metros e totalmente drenada, com vários corpos hídricos. Isso é uma informação muito importante quando falamos sobre questões relacionadas às mudanças climáticas e também as, a questão da socioeconomia. Então, aqui na região, nós temos essa grande faixa de manguezal, bem desenvolvido e preservado, com árvores de aproximadamente chegam até 40 metros de altura. Temos, ao longo dessa faixa de manguezal, toda uma comunidade tradicional que tanto faz o extrativismo quanto a pesca, movimentando toda uma economia tradicional, sem falar em todo, toda a questão da, do carbono azul. Ao mesmo tempo, nós temos nessa região grandes metrópoles, como aqui na foto, a cidade de Belém, que fica próximo ao rio Pará, e temos também a cidade de Macapá, que fica às margens do rio Amazonas. Então, é interessante notar que, num ambiente bem próximo, nós temos um ambiente altamente urbanizado, nós temos um, um outro ambiente altamente preservado, no caso, os mangues. E essa região costeira amazônica, ela é uma interseção entre um sistema de florestas drenado por grandes rios e o sistema oceânico, o Oceano Atlântico Sul e Norte, uma vez que a linha do Equador né, passa é, nessa região, na cidade de Macapá. Então, aqui nós temos todo um contexto econômico importante para a região. 
É, quando tratamos sobre o rio Amazonas e o rio Pará, o rio Amazonas nós temos uma vazão aproximada de 200 mil metros cúbicos por segundo, enquanto que o rio Pará, uma vazão também muito expressiva de 20 mil, né, uma ordem de grandeza menor, mas 20 mil metros cúbicos por segundo. E nós temos uma conexão entre esses dois rios pela parte continental. Aproximadamente 5% das águas do Amazonas fluem para o rio Pará e estes atingem o Atlântico. Junto com este aporte hídrico importante, né, vamos ter o transporte de sedimento através da pluma, transporte de nutrientes, que influencia grande parte da plataforma e de toda a região, e também o transporte do lixo marinho. Ao longo desses dois sistemas, ao longo de todo o sistema hídrico da região costeira, nós temos várias cidades que não têm uma, um sistema de coleta de lixos adequado e esses lixos acabam, muitas vezes, indo para os rios. Uh, a parte, né, a gente tem um, um contexto econômico muito importante, nós temos o um processo de extrativismo do açaí, o açaí que ocorre numa porção mais interna né, do, da região costeira, é, ele é exportado para o mundo todo. Nós temos as hidrovias, que com grande produção da soja, que é produzida no centro-oeste do Brasil, através de comboios de balsas, e essas chegam até os portos localizados mais próximos à região oceânica, e onde ocorre também esse transporte. E também temos uma atividade muito forte da mineração, principalmente do alumínio, que fica, esses processos ficam localizados próximos também de rios e requer um cuidado especial no contexto ambiental. Já na plataforma continental, nós temos uma biodiversidade né, específica, nós temos uma grande faixa de um, um mega habitat bentônico, que foi descrito, já foi identificado há muito tempo, mas foi melhor descrito recentemente, um ambiente recifal que ocorre ao longo de toda a plataforma continental. Nós temos, através da corrente norte do Brasil, que flui com uma intensidade muito forte, todo o transporte do sargaço, né? então a gente visualizou isso em várias pesquisas, e que esse sargaço ele acaba se tornando um problema ambiental em outras regiões, em outros países, e ele flui passando em frente ao Amazonas e o Rio Pará, e tem toda uma atividade de pesca tradicional muito importante, para principalmente na questão da subsistência. Então, em cima de todos esses contextos né, de, de ambientais e econômicos, nós temos algumas iniciativas, né? vários projetos foram executados por várias equipes, né? mas nós temos um... Eu vou só citar o último que terminamos agora, há poucos meses, o projeto Costa Norte, um projeto inter e multidisciplinar, envolvendo várias áreas de conhecimento. Aqui eu só destaco, por exemplo, o, além de outros, né, outras análises químicas, análises hidrológicas, nós lançamos vários derivadores, os drifters, que ao longo de, de um ano, mais de 140 derivadores, em que pudemos observar processos, tanto de plataforma quanto costeiro, tanto de larga escala como em uma escala menor, em frequências distintas também. Inclusive, lançamos alguns desses derivadores na mancha de sargaço, né? e acompanhamos e tivemos derivadores que é, chegaram no Atlântico Norte e e tiveram uma trajetória bem interessante. É, em, em cima de todo um levantamento de dados, né, nós desenvolvemos um modelo costeiro regional, pegando desde o rio, a parte do rio Amazonas e rio Pará, entrando até aproximadamente mil quilômetros dentro do rio Amazonas, passando pela parte estuarina e se estendendo até a plataforma continental. Uma vez esse modelo validado, né, calibrado e validado, nós fizemos um, um refinamento em vários estuários da costa, né, fazendo um downscaling dessa malha maior para áreas mais específicas e que, depois de trabalhados, 
eles também servem para um upscaling para entender os processos do Atlântico como um todo. Detalhe é que nós utilizamos um método da malha flexível, fazendo a modelagem não só nos canais, mas também nas planícies de inundação dos manguezais. E é, utilizando a técnica de lidar para fazer o, o, a topografia detalhada dessas áreas de manguezais, conseguimos identificar a frequência de inundação em vários desses sistemas, em vários estuários. Isso é uma informação muito importante na hora de trabalharmos com questões de mudanças climáticas, a questão das atividades econômicas, seja a pesca, seja a aquicultura ou seja o turismo. Então, nós temos um detalhamento dessa frequência de inundação que é, nos permitiu identificar vulnerabilidade desse ambiente a determinados fatores. Marcelo, nós... E aí, ok, nós temos uma base de dados de aproximadamente 10 anos, e a ideia é que toda essa base de dados fique disponível, então nós temos o Observatório da Costa Amazônica, uma iniciativa que foi criada, que está sendo tocada pelos jovens pesquisadores da Amazônia, onde você tem dados observados, dados previstos e todo um contexto social. E como perspectiva, nós estamos fazendo aqui a criação do iCentre Amazônia, onde já temos a Universidade Federal do Pará, o Museu Guild e o INPE, em que a base vai ser situada no Laboratório de Monitoramento Ambiental Marinho. Então, eu finalizo deixando o convite para o evento de inauguração do iCentre Amazônia, que ocorrerá em novembro de 2020, Linking Grand Blue Amazonas. Obrigado a todos. Muito bom. Thank you, Marcelo. Very good. Uh, I think you gave the audience a very, uh, very good perspective of the beautiful uh, river uh, and estuarine uh, system uh, and how you guys are studying it using different methodologies of data collection, numerical modeling, remote sensing, and gave and gave us this very very nice uh, end of the yeah, proposition just, uh, of, of their center, Amazonia, which is very, uh, I, I haven't heard about it, but uh, congratulate you for that. Okay, the next uh, speaker uh, is uh, Fionn Atkins uh, of South Africa. We have a recorded presentation that she left uh, uh, to be presented. <clears throat> Catariana, could you please uh, have the uh, presentation of Afion Atkins? Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Atkins, uh, unfortunately, she could not be present uh but she left uh, her presentation recorded so uh, as soon as they have it ready to to start we'll have uh, the chance to see what she's doing in south africa i do i would ask again katarina duarte can you hear us <clears throat> I would uh, ask Marcelo if you have uh, something uh, very brief and quick that you would like to say in this uh, while they are getting the Fion presentation. Please take up this few <laughs> moments to, if you want, of course. Okay. Obrigado pela oportunidade de falar mais um pouco. É, temos muita coisa para fazer aqui na região amazônica, precisamos de parceria do mundo todo, isso aqui é uma área de grande interesse, né, no contexto tanto nacional quanto internacional, e eu acho que a criação do iCentre Amazônia vai ser uma grande oportunidade para unirmos esforços 
para o desenvolvimento da pesquisa e para a formação de recursos humanos aqui na região, que a gente precisa bastante. Então, eu estou bem empolgado, eu, eu já sou empolgado, mas eu estou bem empolgado com as possibilidades de unir esforços em prol de, de, do desenvolvimento da pesquisa da região costeira amazônica, que ainda tem grandes lacunas, tanto a parte biótica, abiótica, quanto social. Ok, Marcelo, thank you very much. I would, I would ask again, uh, next person is... Uh... A, a film Atkins. So we are waiting for the video, okay, that she recorded, we presented. Okay, people are suggesting that we go ahead for the next uh, speaker. So, uh, José Lino, are you ready to, yes. to go? So yes, let, we're going to move for the presentation of José Lino Costa. Please, José. Yes, uh, I'm ready. I hope you hear me well. Yes, perfect. And, and you can see uh, my slides, yes? Yes, perfect. Yes, perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as João said before, uh, my presentation will be about uh, the importance of in-situ and remote monitoring for the knowledge and function uh, and preservation of coastal and estuarine areas. I try to uh, uh, make this, the objectives of this talk to be included in the objectives of the session. So uh, I'm going to analyze the different monitoring types used in estuaries and coastal areas of Portuguese continent uh, with special emphasis on major constraints and the future, future outlook of these monitoring uh, processes. So, we generally, we have three types of monitoring types. Uh, so, and in Portugal, we have these uh, three types of, of monitoring uh, programs. And uh, most the, the first ones are directed to uh, are the directed monitoring. This is monitoring to answer to specific questions with a theory and basic hypothesis. Uh, usually, we implement this type of monitoring when we are trying to uh, analyze the impacts of a project like ports, aquacultures, and so on. Of course, we can use it, and we use it also in some cases in some projects. We are using, we used it before, and we are using now uh, monitoring of uh, the impacts of activities. For in for instance, the impact of fisheries activities. And uh, another type of monitoring, uh, of direct monitoring, is that of the effects of protection. For instance, to see if uh, the protection, the implementation of a marine protected area uh, will have the, the impacts, the positive impacts that we expect that happen. So these are directed monitoring uh, uh, programs uh, with uh, uh, specific questions to answer. Then we have another type of, of monitoring that was we call, we can call it as mandatory monitoring to uh, uh, comply with the requirements of some legislation or directives. Uh, in Portugal, right now, we have mostly two types of, uh, of mandatory uh, monitoring programs in uh, uh, marine and estuarine areas, and uh, especially in coastal areas in the marine case. That, that are the Water Framework Directive and Marine Strategy fr uh, Framework Directives. They are, relate, they are uh, uh, European directives and Portugal, like the other European countries, have to comply with the obligations of these, uh, of these directives and to make monitoring uh, in that case. And of course, we have a third uh, type of uh, monitoring programs. We call it uh, surveillance monitoring. We can also say that these are passive monitoring without any uh, theory or basic assumptions. Uh, uh, in fact, we have no immediate questions to try to respond, but they are very useful because we are gathering information that we can use after that in uh, uh, many cases, like, for instance, to analyze climate change or to use in eco economic development. So going directly now to directed monitoring, of course, the most uh, uh, no, no, uh, known 
directed monitoring are those that uh, use the BACHI methodology before, after control impact. What we, we should do is to make sampling before the implementation of the project, after the implementation of the project, and in areas that are areas uh, that are subject to that impact. It can be a positive impact like the marine protected areas, a negative impact, for instance, like a, a construction of a, por a port where it's zone, something like that. And uh, together with the um, impact areas, we should have control areas, which should have the same uh, uh, characteristics as the, uh, as the impact areas, but without the influence of the project. So this is the theory, but usually this is not so easy to do it. And the most important problems that we should do with, the most important constraints for this, is that uh, for this batchy uh, program could be implemented, we should have uh, sampling before the implementation of the project or before the implementation of the marine protected area. And in most cases, we have not time to do that because uh, many times when they ask us to make the monitoring, the, uh, the construction or the implementation of the marine protected area is already uh, beginning. So we have not uh, enough time to uh, make this uh, sampling before the implementation of the project of the, or, or of the marine protected area. And another thing that is very important in, S, in, in coastal areas and especially in estuarine areas, that we have a high special and temporal variability and especially in estuaries, we have relatively limited size of the estuary. So it is very, very difficult to have really control areas because the, uh, even if we go one kilometer or uh, two kilometers upstream or downstream, we have uh, already completely different characteristics of those areas. So it is very difficult to establish reference sites. So considering these two constraints, the difficulty in established reference sites and the non-existence uh, of uh, pre-sampling uh, uh, before the implementation makes us to have only to, to get treatment sites prefer preferably with the gradient design as you can see here in the, in the right, we can have uh, different types of gradient designs, or we should use methodologies that do not require reference situation. For instance, indexes, you can use them uh, and you, you, you can use them uh, instead of uh, the, the design of Batchy. And of course, in this case, we have to make the, to extend our studies for a, long, a longer period because with the Batchy design, probably two, three years, it's enough to, to see if we have the impacts of the projects of the, of the marine protected areas. But out, uh, without this, uh, this deep type of design, we should have more time to, can, to, to see the trends. Uh, the recent uh, trend is toward to be less demanding, especially in uh, uh, what uh, is referred to um, project uh, monitoring, and this is uh, diminishing the quality of the studies. This is a really problem here in Portugal. I understand it is not uh, only for, from Portugal, but in Portugal, this is a, a major problem. Regarding mandatory monitoring, uh, we can talk about the Water Framework Directive and Marine Strategy Framework Directive. The major, uh, these are the, the obligations of the, uh, the state members to, to make the, the monitoring uh, like this for Water Framework Directive, phytoplankton, other plants, bentons, fish should be analyzed and for marine strategy we have uh, 11 descriptors, those that are referred here, that should be analyzed. Major constraints to these mandatory monitoring programs uh, and for its future, it, it is that this is a highly demanding process. Costs and lots of time pressure to, to develop the methodologies and to implement it. Difficulties to developing the methodologies and the intercalibration program because all a member states should have uh, methodologies that uh, could be intercalibrated, and this is very difficult to do it. 
and difficulties resulting uh, relating with the results of specific pressures and implemented measures. We can say that we should that we have problems in one place, but we cannot say if, if it is because of one pressure or the other pressure. And this is an, an aspect that we should develop our methodologies a little bit more in the future. So difficult to comply with the sampling periodicity also and to act in accordance with that results obtained. So it is difficult to have the time and to have the money to do all these mandatory monitoring programs. Regarding surveys monitoring, I'm going to give only an example of CoastNet of infrastructure that I'm the coordinator. We have all also other, other infrastructure, uh, infrastructures there, but the main goals of the CoastNet are to obtain remote and local observations of the Portuguese coast, integrate and permit visualization of the obtained data and allow free access to near real time and historical data. One minute, that we, uh, one minute, yes? <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, we have a coastal remote sensing system, a satellite data processing center, the environmental and biological monitoring system, a probe and sensor system to measure environmental variables, the Portuguese tracking network, the system of acoustic telemetry receiver detection lines, and all of this information is given uh, by free to all people that want to uh, and, uh, download them from that portal. Finally, uh, I, uh, I would say that in situ monitoring have some advantages and some disadvantage. We can see some comparison here of higher costs for implementation of in situ, but higher in initial costs for the remote monitoring. You have less spatial cover and less temporal uh, cover for uh, in situ monitoring, but you have small number of parameters that you could use uh, in a remote uh, monitoring. And the, the, uh, only to, to refer this, it is very important to uh, stress this because when we are working in uh, coastal areas and special in estuaries, the things are much more difficult because of the special heterogeneity and temporal variability, which uh, oblige us to have a sampling uh, in more uh, areas with higher frequency. And of course, we have lots of human pressure in these areas and it in there, in there sometimes the operations we, that we should do. And any questions we, we can, uh, I can answer after uh, later. Okay. Sorry. Okay, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Jose. It was really interesting talk and gave us uh, another perspective of what generally we call monitoring. Yeah? People normally tend to see monitoring as a one thing. And you showed us that they can be really applied in different uh, circumstances. And each one of those circumstances demand different types of monitoring with their specificities. Huh? their difficulties and their limitations and potentials. And also the need of in situ data and how you one should put together in situ and remote sensing and uh, monitoring together. It was very, very interesting. Thank you for your talk. I just want to see if we are gonna have, uh, uh, yes, I got the information that we will have now the video of, uh, John Atkins, so that uh, uh, we'll be waiting for the video to come out. Thanks, Jose. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fionn Atkins, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, my sincere apologies for not being able to present my work today in person, albeit virtually, but thank you very much to Jose Moutinho for inviting me to present at the summit. I'll be talking about urban nitrogen budgets and its relation to the clean and productive, one of the themes of the, of the air center, which is the clean and productive coastal zones, bays, estuaries, bays and estuaries to sustain biodiversity and ecosystem services for a blue economy. So our world is mostly urban. 
This is a satellite composite image of the Earth by night, and it shows that much of the coastline that encases the Atlantic Ocean is indeed urbanized. You can see that the Northern Hemisphere is far more urbanized than the Southern Hemisphere, and that Africa is far less built up than Europe and the Americas. So a large majority of our urban areas are situated on or have an impact on the coastal zone. Roughly 75% of our global population live on the coast. Today, 55% of the world's population live in cities, and it's estimated that by 2050, this will increase to 68%, almost 70%. And the environmental consequences of this represent one of the most urban challenges for today's society. So this momentum of urbanization or this rate of change will result in unprecedented demands on ecosystem services. So cities depend on the productive and assimilative capacities of ecosystems well beyond their city boundaries. The ecological footprints as such of cities require to sustain human life in cities, both by producing the flows of energy, material and material goods, and assimilating waste generating cities, waste generated by cities, for example, wastewater. So this is the urban boundary effectively, and the resources required to, get, to sustain that city are far reaching. So the environmental impact of the city extends beyond its spatial footprint. Um, obviously into the terrestrial realm, but also into the coastal realm as well, especially if it is a coastal city, as many are. So I'm going to discuss the flow of one waste product of a city, nitrogen, which can be, which is observed in atmospheric, terrestrial and aquatic systems. I'll discuss some ways that nitrogen impacts the coastal zone and how we can begin, begin to manage it better. So nitrogen, human activities um, have more than doubled the nitrogen turnover rates. This is through synthetic fertilizer, um, the synthetic fixation of nitrogen, nitrogen fixing crops and fossil fuel combustion. And this has vastly increased the availability of nitrogen in the environment with impacts on the coastal zones or coastal ecosystems. One namely is harmful algal blooms so here we have this graph on the left, the relative abundance of a diatom, toxic diatom, pseudonitsia, as a function of nitrate loading. Higher, higher nitrate loading increases relative abundance of pseudonitsia. On the right, we have long-term trends in nitrogen-based fertilizer use in the black bars and the number of occurrences of red tide in Chinese coastal waters. This is in China, but this trend is observed in many parts of the world. It also induces hypoxia in, many, in, in coastal zones across the globe. This is a global map indicating the coastal sites where anthropogenic nutrients have exacerbated or caused oxygen declines to less than two milligrams per liter. These red dots are hypoxic areas and these blue are um, oxygen minimum zones at 100, 300 meters of depth. There are other impacts as well, such as lake acidification, biodiversity loss, habitat degradation. And these all impact coastal ecosystem services. They deplete the capacity of these systems to provide ecosystem services. They also reduce the productivity in coastal estuaries and bays. It's been estimated that harmful algal blooms cause an economic loss of roughly $8 billion per year globally. This is a study that recently came out by researchers at University of Exeter and Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Here I'd like to highlight some work done by previous colleagues, uh, Marie Smith and Stuart Bernard, who was my, super, my PhD supervisor. On the top here we have, um, it shows a high biomass bloom of um, phytoplankton on the south coast of South Africa, very typical of Southern African waters, high biomass blooms. And some of Marie's work is differentiating that into different fu functional types. Um, this is a dinoflagellate, a high biomass bloom of dinoflagellates. 
Here, indicated in the blue diamonds, is the location of two primary water intake pipes for abalone farms in the area. So abalone farms have become an important component of the blue economy in South Africa. And as we tap into our blue economy more, um, the exacerbation of natural phenomena like HABs by this increased loading of nutrients um, into the coast, it will become problematic. So I'm not saying that all HABs are direct, directly related to excess nutrient loading, but as I've shown, there is a very clear relationship between the two. And it does and it will impact the blue economy. Suffice to say that nitrogen management is crucial, but you can't manage what you don't measure. And uh, in an urbanized context, measuring nitrogen um, is complex. Cities are heterogeneous, and um, especially in, in an African setting or context, data is very scarce in um, African cities. So this is where urban metabolism can come in. So urban metabolism is essentially, it's, it's an approach to quantifying resource flows into, within, and out of an urban system. Um, and these resources can be energy, water, uh, material goods, nutrients. Um, so this is the urban metabolism of um, nitrogen done for the city of Paris. So here we have this green sphere, which represents the city boundary and the inflows of nitrogen via food imports, fossil fuel imports, denitrification. Things happen within the urban space and is discharged out of the urban environment as into receiving waters, into landfill, or into the atmosphere for atmospheric transport and deposition. So one thing I'd like to say about urban metabolism is that it most often focuses on the human mediated flows. So the socioeconomic component of the system, but um, we need to be able to incorporate the ecological processes and e ecosystem dynamics into this approach. It's essentially integrating the socioeconomic sciences with the ecological and the biogeochemical sciences as well. And there's a need to make this spatially explicit. So let me draw your attention to Cape Town. Um, aside from agriculture, sewage is one of the primary sources of nutrient pollution into the coastal ecosystems. This is Cape Town. These photos were taken within the last year. This is the surface water discharge passing through um, agricultural and urban areas. And this is a raw surge discharge from the Atlantic seaboard and a very iconic image of Cape Town as well. So I'm attempting, I'm in the process of quantifying the urban nitrogen fluxes into, um, at this stage, into an urban watershed of Cape Town, but I do have the goal of, of scaling it up to the city level. Um, and I'm focusing here on the southern side of Cape Town. Water flows, drains the, the, the urban system into a wetland and out to False Bay, which is an important um, bay for many inhabitants of Cape Town. Oh, sorry, so how do I link land use to nitrogen loading? So I've chosen this watershed. Um, by the way, it's a highly modified watershed, uh, highly modified in the sense that its, it's, it's catchment is mostly dictated by stormwater canals now. It's a coastal low-lying floodplain. And this watershed comprises of residential in yellow, peri-urban agricultural in brown, pink indicates informal settlements, and this is drained by the stormwater canals into the Zikufle catchment, into the Zikufle wetland, sorry, um, which then flows out into False Bay. We also have a wastewater treatment works that also discharges its effluent into the bay as well. So for the sake of simplicity here, we've got a, we need to conceptualize our urban cycle, our urban nitrogen cycle or budget. 
uh, done this via inputs and outputs. Um, I've simplified it for the sake of today. So inputs are nitrogen deposition, biological nitrogen fixation, fertilizer, stormwater runoff, and food. And outputs are denitrification, volatilization. So these are microbially mediated processes. NOx emissions, which is from fossil fuel combustion, agricultural crop yield, surface water, and wastewater. And I've collated as much information as is available in the literature, as well as with the city of Cape Town, and um, visualized it by way of a Sankey diagram. So Sankey diagram shows the flows of nitrogen so in kilograms of nitrogen per year as inputs flowing out as outputs. So the thickness of the line is directly proportional to the magnitude of flow. And the colors indicate the source of information. So green is um, observation. This has been observed. Lighter green is modeled information um, based on some data that I found within the literature. Red is an unknown, I don't know this information yet. And blue is anecdotal evidence that um, the city of Cape Town told me. So if we look at what comes into the system, we have bulk deposition and NOx emissions. I've treated the total NOx emissions to be deposited onto the surface again to contribute to runoff. We've also got low on fertilizer and agricultural fertilizer. This all contributes to the total runoff that eventually enters as an inlet into the Zikufle wetland. Firstly, what we can see is that there's a lot that's not been accounted for here. How much more nitrogen is being inputted from, from the urban catchment that we haven't accounted for? This could be commercial industrial discharges. Um, so what flows in and then as it flows out into False Bay, we can see that much more flows in than flows out. This is good. This means that nitrogen is, is, faint, is essentially either um, accumulating, well, is accumulating in this wetland. Um, but outputs also, there's unknowns. Denitrification, how much of it is being denitrified in the sediments of the, of the wetland? How much is being taken up by phytoplankton? And green waste actually indicates the, the reeds and the water hyacinth that have, that have proliferated, have grown as a result of this nitrogen input into the flay. So much of the nitrogen actually is obtained or contained within this biomass, which is then frequently or periodically removed um, from the city of Cape Town or by the city of Cape Town from this flay. So yeah, the reds, they're unknowns. Um, I couldn't get food imports into at this stage because during, during COVID, I was meant to run some household surveys. Um, so there's a lot of information that we still have yet to, to take. But what we can say is that, this is the 20 year time series from the city of Cape Town, the inflow of nitrogen or nitrogen concentrations at the inflow into the flay are higher than the nitrogen concentrations at the outflow of the flay, indicating that the wetland is acting to remove some of this nitrogen before it enters the coast. So wetlands are providing an important ecosystem service to the city of Cape Town. So I'll just wrap up here. Um, urban nitrogen budgets, I argue, are useful to identify gaps in data and knowledge. Um, and also from what from this preliminary assessment we can see that the benefits of investing in urban ecological infrastructure such as wetlands are far reaching not only for the city of cape town but also potentially for the blue economy as well and more work in this is needed urban systems are highly heterogeneous and complex and they require multiple sources of data it's an integrated um, endeavor, an integrated science endeavor, essentially. Um, and so where can remote sensing begin to fill the gaps, especially in a context which is 
data scarce, such as rapidly urbanizing African cities. And I'll stop there. So thank you very much for your attention. And I apologize for not being present to be able to ask to answer any questions, but please do message me or email me. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> we thank uh, uh, Fiona Atkins for uh, preparing uh, her presentation. As you could see, I could not put my one minute to her. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was something I could not do, okay? No problem. Uh, <clears throat> let's move on to the last uh, but not least talk. And I would ask, uh, I would ask Francisco Campuzano uh, to present his talk. Francisco, please. Perfect. We can't hear you. Yeah, okay. I have to mute okay. myself. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and to be in this very nice panel of uh, presenters. I would like to, to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done recently about integrating ocean and coastal processes and in both senses, and I will explain it uh, later. So since the, the theme for this uh, meeting was the uh, the blue economy, I just wanted to highlight a little bit the importance of the, the blue economy and that most of the actions related with the blue economy are taking place in near the coastal area, like the buildings, transport fisheries. So most of it, even if the ocean is so big, is taking place in, in, in the coast and, uh, and it's providing a lot, and the ocean there is providing a lot of services. So we need to, to model or to uh, forecast the, the, what is happening there with a, a lot of attention. Just uh, to show you an image about the mainland Portugal, uh, about the importance also of the coastal areas. You can see that it's a very coastal nation. Uh, the, the coastline is about 950 kilometers long. That takes like 70% of the population. So you can see the density of population in the coastal area. So it's a very relevant uh, a subject in, in Portugal. And something that we, we would like to, to change, or we think that is a, a changing paradigm, and I'm very happy to have seen some of the presentations of my colleagues, is oceanographers used to, to look at the ocean like this, but we should start looking at it as, as a whole, with a holistic approach, where water sets are also part of the ocean and influence uh, the coastal area. Normally, in the oceanic processes are not, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's not totally regarded as, or they don't have the importance that, uh, that they should. So I will uh, illustrate this with uh, the work that we do, that is, uh, is uh, mainly numerical modeling. And this is uh, what we have here is the water set and the ocean is, is what is now regarded as earth system model, but we will look only on the surface. So, at the water set, we have rainwater, they have estuary fluxes that goes and come back from the ocean. Like we can have data or models. In our case, we do everything with, with models, uh, but when we have data also, we, we use it. But uh, we are, our main strong point is developing numerical models. So we have developed this model, it's called MOIT. They have two main uh, components that is <clears throat> MOIT, the land, sorry, for water set and MOIT water for ocean and storing areas. So it's a model, it's a model, a community model. It has been applied uh, in many places, uh, especially in muddy water, that is the, the oldest one has been applied uh, almost everywhere in every continent. And also uh, muddy land is increasing the application. And we have many institutions using it. The model is open source. So if you, if you have any question afterwards, you want to contact me, feel free to do it. Now, coming back to the, to the presentation and, and to the ocean processes, sometimes those, those processes reach the coastal area and with different scales. Here we can see the sea surface uh, temperature uh, in the global model from the Copernicus. And here is our study area, Western Iberia. Here you can see the model, the global model. And here you can see our model in results. So they differ a little bit because normally when we go to the coastal area, 
we have the capacity of using a better uh, or higher resolution model for the atmosphere. And this is this has a, an impact in a pooling system like, like this one here. You can see that uh, our pooling is stronger than the one uh, simulated by the, uh, by the global model. We can look to other processes like that, like waves, waves uh, that we receive in the Western area are generated sometimes in the other side of the of the Atlantic. So we need to look at the ocean to reproduce uh, the effects of, of or the conditions in our coastal areas. And then if we look to an example that I will illustrate here, this is the this is where is located in Lisbon. It's our institution location. This is the Tagus story and the other stories. But if we look at this conceptually, we have the influence from the oceanic waters. We have two main rivers, especially the Tagus River is a very large river, reaching the, the area. We have other small contributions. We have a small mountain ranges that affect the wind. We have a depth welling system, as I saw before, marine protected areas, bathing water. Uh, we have dynamic plumes from the estuaries, and then we have several threats like oil and HNS spills, erosion system. We have flooding. And just to illustrate this, this is the city center of Lisbon with a massive flooding due to rain and the combination with with tides. This is the the transport from marine traffic in the, in the, the traffic density in front of mainland Portugal, so it's, a, it's very dense. We have erosion uh, near the, the coastal area, so we need to have uh, all this uh, part well established and, and to try to provide some solutions. So we don't scale from those general patterns that are coming to, to our coast to other final resolution models, and then we can provide a final scale to these processes that are taking place in the coastal area. Also, when we have looked at the ocean, but now if we look on the on the water side, we need water side models because uh, we we need also forecast and we need and we don't have uh, all the data that we want from water side. So this is how a typical water side model works, where you have a uh, rainwater and then it's collected there uh, at the end at the exit of the water set. But now in our model, we are able to do for multiple water sets, like you can see here, and at different scales. So we need this scale for having the Tagus River that is crossing the Iberian Peninsula, etc. And then when we have the rain, we can populate uh, and numerically uh, the, the, the system and we obtain what we call this water cycle where we can see the river, estuary and open ocean. Try to fit also the coastal ocean. Look, just for illustrating this, I can show you a, an example of the influence of, in the coastal area. This is a some flooding events in 2013. This is around the Lisbon area. And then you can see that even a, a large estuary like the Tagus, that normally salinity is around 32, drop it to eight uh, salinity units. And normally what people is using in, in for uh, ocean processes, they are trying to, to use climatologies for simulating the rivers. And this is a, not a is the, the, the one that was performing the worst in several case studies that we did with data and numerical models. Then we have also the tides that we have, that the river is not discharging continuously. It's like a, it's pulsing the water in the ocean. So we are extracting this, this type of information and putting it into our regional ocean model. Here we can see that even a massive plume that we have of combination of several rivers. Uh, instead of just looking to one of the stories, we can also look to a portion of the of the coastal area, uh, like this stretch that is uh, a few kilometers. This is what is known as West Iberia Boyan Plume. It's present all year long and fed by several rivers altogether. And then we can go to other small scales, like uh, this is next to, to Lisbon, the historical coast, and sometimes what manager needs is these small discharges of uh, small water lines that can bring uh, pollution or fecal uh, contamination. And this for bathing waters, we need this very fine resolution, like 35, kilo, uh, 35 meters. So we can define whether uh, bathing is, is a good or, or bad activity at, the, at that time, or they need to be close. 
This is from another project that is called Forecoast. In this case, we are providing a forecast for tides inside of the story to oyster producers. So maybe they don't need sometimes very uh, complex information, but even if we can help them to reach to the production areas in time, and then we can help them to, to know the, the weather condition, it would be a, a, a good contribution for them. This is another from another application. This is HAPS or Harfum Algal Blooms. Then when it's located, it is in the south of Portugal. And with a, a Laurentian model that we also have, we are able, if they are detected, we are able to tell them where it will go and then it can be translated into closure of some uh, coastal areas, or some beaches. So uh, it's a, a direct application. Also, nine, we, nine minutes already. Huh? Thank you. Okay, I'm about to, to finish. So uh, we go here also for, for oil spills. This is from an old application as Prestige in, in 2002, very well known. And then we were also doing forecasts with, with this, uh, uh, for this type of event. We need to reproduce well the, the front and salinity and temperature fronts in the coastal area to reproduce well uh, this condition. So just to conclude, numerical models are able to simulate open ocean, water set, coastal area processes, and to integrate the different time and spatial scale. Numerical modeling is a, power, a powerful tool for downscaling processes and to integrate them. Uh, blue economy activities uh, can directly benefit from the forecast capacity of uh, coastal models, also in combination with uh, in-situ data and observations. And then this type of methodology is generic and can be uh, developed and, and modified or established for any coastal, any coastal area. So thank you very much for, for your attention. And uh, if you need any, any question or comment. Thank you, Francisco. It was an excellent, beautiful presentation and gave us uh, the real perspective and uh, explained quite clearly the need to integrate large-scale processes of the ocean and atmosphere with land and small-scale processes and things that, that are happening in land and uh, the need to downscale uh, the models and to include all these different processes uh, if we really want to, to get a, a very good uh, view of the system. It's something that's not trivial to be done but as you showed us, huh, it can be done, okay? And I thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think we have uh, already finished with the presentations now. And um, we could go for the question and answer session, 15 minutes session, okay? Um, as I'm expecting some people to, to submit their question, I would like to put uh, to any, any one of you one uh, of my uh, questions. That is, uh, we have heard that the, um, there are perspectives of uh, real uh, sea level rise huh, due to climate change in the next 50 years or 100 years, okay? And certainly this will have an enormous impact in certain areas. Uh, particular areas around the globe, globally. Huh? And uh, what, what could we do, not in terms of preventing the sea level, because we cannot do that, but in terms of research, okay? How can we help the governments to be prepared and uh, to be more resilient to this sea level rise? Does anybody uh, of you want to shed some lights into this type of uh, concern. You could start the Campuzano. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> I think that the, what this type of uh, management, uh, of management activities, and it has to be a combination of, and, and to try to, to involve the participation of many, many stakeholders, and also people that are collecting information. But I think that models here, they have a very interesting uh, role since we can determine which areas uh, can be more affected than others and where they should concentrate because it's not a, a linear process that is affecting all the coastal area uh, 
as, as it is. So even sometimes for managers, the, if we, we are able to tell them, okay, it's, the problem is not here in the north part of the beach, it's in the southern part, then we are saving them 50% of, uh, of the effort. So I think that this is how, how modeling can, uh, at least, uh, or um, forecast can, can contribute also using climate models to force our local and calibrated models can also be a, a good contribution. But I leave also to, to the, the rest of the panel to, to add more light. Okay, Jose Lino, would you like to put your comments on, on this uh, problem? You need, you need to turn your, your microphone on. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, related with the monitoring programs, uh, uh, one of the things that is very important to advise the, the planner, the people that are uh, doing the planning of uh, uh, coastal areas, it's try to avoid uh, the construction in areas that will be of uh, in danger of being submerged. So this is a very important task to do in the future. And the monitoring can uh, highlight some of the problems that uh, what we are uh, seeing right now uh, uh, to prepare for what is happening in the future. And so uh, relating all the things related with the climate change, not only the, um, the rising of the sea, but the alterations that we are seeing in the communities, in the processes, uh, monitoring is essential to uh, help decisions to see the problems that we are dealing with. And of course, uh, uh, modeling is uh, of major importance because it's with that with that that we can make some si some simulations for the future and to see where to protect with uh, more importance in that case. Thank you, Jose. Marcelo, uh, would you like to put something, perhaps on the perspective of uh, your region, the Amazon? Your microphone, please. You. So, the climate change will affect the different areas. So, we need a program to monitoring each area because the problem will be specific for, an, for each region. So, here we have something very different and very difficult, another place of Brazil. And it's very difficult to, to do this monitoring program. So I think the, the monitoring with another, uh, with the modeling and the remote sensing, is, it's important to, to a policy of, of, for the future. So uh, I think that we need you know, uh, the scale. We have a, a problem with a large scale, but each local need a, a specific scale to solve this problem with the, the local characters. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. And how about you, Victoria? What do what you have to say in terms of your area of, of, of interest, Chesapeake Bay? What is, is expected to happen there? Uh, so the Chesapeake Bay is like many areas at high risk of um, sea level rise in part because it's on the coastal plain as Finn, Finn talked about, but also because the land is subsiding strongly. So sea level rise is exacerbated. And um, so I think models have a, a really strong role to play in thinking about flooding not as a bathtub, but as a frequency of flooding events. Um, but they also have a role to play that I think is interesting to consider in terms of economic justice or, or equality, because I'll just cite some recent work by a colleague, Ming Li, who has done um, work allowing low-lying rural areas to flood 
And that when you allow that to happen, you actually reduce the amount of flooding variability in urban areas because some of the impact of that flooding is absorbed in rural areas and it uh, damps the intensity and frequency of flooding in, in Chesapeake Bay that would be in Annapolis and Baltimore. So in fact, the county that um, has been selected to flood it was my own <laughs> and my house is quite low lying. So I think we have a role to play in understanding how we can, I mean, these are hard decisions that we may have to be thinking about in terms of where do we retreat in order to save larger numbers of people from coastal flooding. But I think we have to keep as scientists in the back of our head, the understanding that these have um, these decisions have implications um, for you know people's lives and and uh, so it's I think that this is a really dangerous area in the sense that we're going to be asked to make decisions and projections that um, you know have have really important implications economically and and uh, socially. Yeah, that's interesting what you're saying because uh, I remember here a problem we we have. In São Paulo city, okay, which is a very large city, it's the largest city in Brazil with a huge population, and they have they suffer during, the, particularly during the summer month, with this flush, uh, uh, this strong rain, and it's very uh, brief but very strong and quick. They produce a floodings all over the city, and to to remedy they constructed what we call in Portuguese piscinões, swimming pools, huge swimming pools in the city, okay? To act like you're saying, like a, a, like a buffer area to collect this runoff water into an area, okay? And this uh, piscinões, these huge uh, swimming pools, then they are pumped, the water is pumped out slowly later on, okay? So it's something similar to what you just mentioned. Is, is that correct? I, I guess that's right. And, and it's interesting because uh, stormwater has been intensively managed, but I think that one of the challenges is that we can't manage the ocean nearly as effectively. So, um, you know, sea level rise may be, well, Venice is trying, right? But uh, that may be um, uh, outside of the reach of swimming pools. <laughs> yes. Another thing that I would like to bring uh, to the panelists is the following. I have a, a colleague here in Brazil uh, that tells me when people are talking about sea level rise, that in his opinion, this is not the worst part of the problem. The worst part of, of the problem is the wave action, is the storms that will be associated with a climate change. So there are uh, people who think, uh, who predict that not only the storms will be uh, stronger, but they will be more frequent. And this uh, storms uh, produce much more uh, damage to the coast, the coastline and the ecosystem uh, than sea level rise. And uh, very few people seem to be talking about this, okay? And uh, just to uh, exemplify, we have a coastal city here in uh, Brazil, not far from the place where I am now, uh, is the biggest port city, it's called Santos, okay? And they have uh, the number of, uh, of problems such as this, okay? Uh, with storms hitting the coast and producing a lot of erosion and damage and uh, has increasing in frequency, okay? And, and, and in fact, it's not the same in all the city. It varies from one part of the city to the next. And some places are very well uh, heat and other are kind of uh, spared and uh, not in a, in a single seat. So I would like to put this question for you guys. Would you agree with this fellow that perhaps uh, storms heating 
the coastal zone will be at least as uh, damaging as sea level rise? You could start, <laughs> Victoria, your views about that. Uh, well, I think that's an important point. And these extreme events, I was sort of trying to allude to that it's not just this bathtub rise, but how often you have strong flooding events and hurricanes, large storms are obviously key players in that and contribute, as I understand it, I'm not an expert in this, to, to a huge amount of the coastal erosion that occurs. And, and obviously, um, you know, the frequency of these massive flooding events affects, you know, human habitation on the coast. So I would agree that this is a really important topic. And it's very difficult because the wave activity, as you said, and um, is likely to be the coastal areas are so heterogeneous and spatially variable and they have different shelf activities so the direction of the storm and the wave activity can really really influence the impacts of that so i think that is something that we do need to think about and consider but I, i'm very interested to hear from the rest i would pass the floor to francisco capuzano to to see what he has to tell us francisco please yeah, I think this is a very interesting uh, subject, and I think it's, it's becoming also, I, I don't have the data, but that is more and more frequent. And you can try to rate things like it's waves, it's uh, rain, but but this is what sometimes is called the perfect storm. It's the, the combination of all of them, because normally you have these storms, they have uh, they make the, the, the sea level rise because it's low pressure system. They come with a strong waves, and they have with uh, a lot of rain. So normally in the case of Lisbon, the, this flooding event that I was showing is the combination of rain with high tides, even the, the tides get higher because it's, uh, it's the storm. So this, this uh, all events that they go all together, they are catastrophic in, in, from the socioeconomic point of view. We don't know, I mean, in the terms, in the long term, I don't know if the coast is as resilient for this, but for the blue economy and, and for the, the citizens living in the coastal area is a massive uh, trouble. And, and we are getting, and this is a personal opinion, kind of uh, used to it, used to listen uh, this kind of news. Like uh, now there have been a catastrophic uh, event here and there. And, and I mean, it's, it's becoming more more frequent, but maybe some other people have, people have more, more data than, than I am. Thank you, Jose. Thank would you yeah, like yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. I, I would like. I would say that we have three things that are converging for um, this this type of problem. Probably in some areas for a catastrophe, it is of course the the sea level uh, the sea level rising. The other, it's the increasing of storms, uh, which more storms with more storms and with huge uh, intensity. And the third thing that is very important, at least in Portugal and in the Tagus estuary or in the Mondego estuary, other estuaries in Portugal, is the construction of dams. We have lots of this, the sand re being retained in the dams. And because of that, we have uh, less opposition to the to the sea and to the storms uh, near near the, the mouth so these three things are really very bad and are are, are are provoking big problems here in Portugal and of course every year the, the Portuguese government put sand on the on the littoral and sometimes I would say that it's better to to take out many directly then put sand in the in that areas because in the next uh, uh, winter all the sand is going out and uh, we have to probably uh, as Victoria said before we have to retreat and and try to think for where we should retreat and uh, the, then if we retreat for a place to defend that but probably we should understand that we are losing some territory and we have to deal with that I think so. Have to accept the fate. Yes. yes. <laughs> the Mar fate that we, that we are creating ourselves <laughs> with the, all exactly. the other things that we are dealing with. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Marcelo, would you like to, to, to say something about it? Mm -hmm. I agree. All this fiscal process is very important. 
but I think we need to look to this mangrove system too uh, for the protection of the coastal areas. It's a very important system to protect the coastal areas and we need to look the the social problem, the adaptation and the migration. Uh, the forced migration about the uh, a climate change problem. So uh, the, all the physical process, wave, wind, the sea level rise, it's very important, but we need to look to, to the environmental, coastal zone and the social, social problem and the adaptation and migration of all, all, all biodiversity and the, the human too. Is this. Thank you, thank you, Marcel. I think we are coming uh, to the uh, finishing time for the regular session, and I, I would take this uh, few uh, extra minutes to tell the, our viewers who are in the live stream that uh, they should uh, sign into the Zoom link that uh, is supposed to be in the chat area. Okay, and uh, as soon as we finish here, we will have a 30 minutes more of uh, Q and A in this uh, Zoom link, and you can rejoin there. So I think uh, we are running out of time, and I will take this opportunity again to thank very much to each one of the panelists. All of you presented the excellent views and uh, work you're doing in your specific areas of interest. And uh, the discussion here certainly will continue very lively. And uh, we will rejoin again in the Zoom link. And thank you very much for your contribution. Okay, thank you.